Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Fariha Khan and today I will be presenting the topic of glioblastoma multiform. So in today's presentation, we are going to look at the background and epidemiology of glioblastoma, its pathophysiology, a clinical presentation, diagnosis and imaging, treatment and prognosis. So what is glioblastoma? As you know, we have different glial cells within the brain. These, uh, these serve as supportive tissues for nourishment or uh, cell renewal of the brain. And so glioblastoma is a type of astrocytoma, which is the most aggressive of all the astrocytomas found in the CNS. It is a fast growing tumor type of CNS that forms from the supportive tissue of the brain. It can present uh, as a de novo tumor or it can, uh, it can slowly grow from underlying grade one or grade two low grade gliomas. The first presenting symptoms and signs for glioblastoma can vary depending upon the location of the brain tumor, but it can include any of the following. The list is um, consistent of persistent headaches, blurred vision, vomiting, loss of appetite, changes in ability to think and learn, changes in mood and personality, new onset of seizures and speech difficulties. The most common of these symptoms are the motor um, difficulties that are due to mass effect and the location of the tumor. So the background and epidemiology of uh, glioblastoma is quite diverse. It is the most common of the malignant brain tumors and it makes up approximately 50% of all cases. Its incidence is around three cases per 100,000 uh, people and the incidence is higher in males and it is more in Caucasians as compared to Africans or Afro-Americans. The median age is about 64 years and the survival remains poor despite all the treatment advances and uh, surgeries that are available now. There are uh, a lot of risk factors that, that have been studied for glioblastoma, but the strongest of these is the exposure to ionizing radiation. Now, radiation, um, how we can get radiation, the most common um, is the uh, radiation during childhood uh, in form of any cancer like leukemia. That is the strongest risk factor. But occupational radiation exposure is also common. And um, exposure to radiation in other forms like uh, nuclear radiations is also an important risk factor. Now, the next point is decreased susceptibility to allergies and atopy. Some studies have shown that people with uh, decreased allergies and immune responses, they have an increased risk of glioblastoma, but this uh, risk factor is not as well researched as it should be. Other three risk factors are not uh, well studies, uh, studied, but they include single um, uh, you know, gene uh, depletions and mutations and some rare genetic syndromes like Lee-Fraumeni and Lynch syndrome. And there are others as well like um, Turkel syndrome. But these all account for approximately less than 1% of all glioblastoma cases worldwide. So they don't uh, represent the main bulk of the uh, glioblastoma cases that we see. And lastly, one aspect that is being researched nowadays is the use of uh, cell phones and other electronic devices because they uh, irradiate uh, certain frequencies that can be correlated to the development of glioblastoma sporadically. Now here I have, um, listed the WHO histologic grading system of glioblastoma. We have to understand that this system has been revised multiple times since 1979, and the most recent one was in 2016, in which WHO has now added some molecular alterations in glioblastoma grading, in addition to the, the common histological findings that we see. So we have grade two, three, and four tumors, and now we have added certain uh, molecular alterations which are listed over here. Of these, the most important ones are the isocitrate dehydrogenase mutation and the MGMT methylation status, because these are the ones that are gonna guide the therapy and uh, the diagnosis. This is a large complex table that can further emphasize my point of how complex um, the whole grading system um, has evolved to be. This is the WHO, um, grading system of astrocytic and oligodendroglial tumors. I want you to pay attention to the top half of the, uh, this box, where you can see that astrocytomas are now uh, divided based on not only the tumor grade, which is the histopathological differentiation, but also the characteristic genetic features. 
Uh, and of, of all of these, we uh, have to pay attention to glioblastoma over here, which is divided ma mainly on IDH uh, type, which is the wild type and the mutant type. And you can see the certain genetic um, features that are associated with it, which is the IDH1 and 2 mutation, the third promoter mutations, and all that. So the most common type of glioblastomas are the isocitrate hydrogenase wild type and mutant type. The isocitrate dehydrogenase wild type glioblastoma is the most common primary malignant brain tumor in adults. Uh, histologic variants are present, and uh, these are giant, giant cell glioblastoma, gliosarcoma, and epithelioid glioblastoma. These are not as common as um, the, you know, the general glioblastoma uh, common form that we see, but there are some cases of giant cell glioblastoma, and they carry a poorer prognosis. Whereas if you see the IDH mutant type, it is 10% um, of all the glioblastoma cases, and it is, uh, this occurs in younger adults. The mean age is about 45 years of age. It has a more favorable prognosis, and actually the survival time is twice as long as the IDH wild type. And here um, on the right side of the screen, there is the histological picture of glioblastoma. We can see that generally speaking, glioblastomas uh, represent the, the classic anaplastic nuclei, the mitotic figures, and this has a central necrotic base, which is the most um, characteristic feature of the tumor. It is not a well-circumscribed tumor, so it is more like a liquid mess. That's what I've heard, and that's what I've read about it. Um, the features are dense cellularity, a nuclear polymorphism, mitosis. I think all of this we've all studied before in medical school, but the major thing is that this is not a well-circumscribed tumor mass. It is um, more of a um, proliferating type of tumor. Now the neuroimaging. So there are so many different um, modalities that have been invented in recent times, but we have to keep in mind that um, in many countries, CAT scan is the first imaging that is done uh, for any suspected brain medium. But um, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, that remains more sensitive than CD scan. And with MRI, actually, you can um, get different kind of sequences. So on the right side of the screen, I've inserted a picture where you can see there is an axial T1 weighted MRI that actually shows a left temporal edema in uh, picture A. And when you add uh, the gadolinium infusion, the, which is the contrast, you can actually see a ring enhancement and a proper uh, enhancement of the lien on, uh, on the brain. And then we have other sequences of MRI, which are present here on the left side of the screen. This is known as the flare sequence, the fluid attenuated inversion recovery. This is more recent. And in this, you can actually see different phases of um, the, the contrast and the different, different phases through which it goes and proliferates and it invades the different tumor sites. And you can see the peritumoral edema in picture A. You can see picture B and C where you can see the ring enhancement and the cavitation. So for diagnosis and treatment, this tumor is not confirmed until it is biopsied and it is histopathologically confirmed to be glioblastoma. So the first thing we have to keep in mind is that stereotactic biopsy is the mainstay of diagnosis for glioblastoma. But it is in contrast to open surgery, so we have to choose between the two. And the main um, choosing point, the main decision maker is the basic functional status of the patient, his age, uh, comorbidities and uh, where the tumor is located. We'll talk more about in the next slide. So the preoperative planning includes um, another MRI modality, which is the functional MRI, which is an imaging uh, in which you activate certain speech and sensory function centers and motor function centers by stimuli. And that actually permits the separation of tumor from the normal brain and the surrounding edema preoperatively. There's another technique, diffusion tensor imaging, that is also uh, just like functional MRI, but it actually um, can visual, may help you visualize the relationship between the tumor and the, uh, you know, the white matter fiber tracts that are present in the brain. And on the right side of the screen, I've added two very important things for the supportive management, steroids and anti-seizure drugs. Um, we, have to, um, we have to assess here that when the, when the patient presents firstly to a physician with signs and symptoms that are uh, pointing towards a, uh, towards a brain lien, we have to keep in mind that physical examination and neurological examination, they are the mainstay because they're going to guide the urgency of neurosurgical um, 
intervention. So at that time, if the patient is not stabilized, we have to provide steroids to reduce the edema and the intracranial pressure. And if they have seizures, we have to treat them with levetiracetam. Every other imaging comes after this first intervention. So for surgery, because this is a tumor and mostly these tumors have a mass effect on the brain and that is um, showing in the form of um, you know, physical symptoms. So we have to do surgery first on the tumor. Now the surgery is based on two things, uh, whether the tumor is resectable or not. So uh, that, is th that decision is made based on all the imaging techniques. Now, if, this, uh, if the tumor is deep seated or if there are multifocal tumors, then we can use some computerized imaging and stereotactic devices, and those can help in uh, performing deep brain biopsies in which you can actually locate the tumor, you can get a biopsy and get the histopathological evaluation done and you can confirm glioblastoma. Now, um, in this uh, you know, stereotactic biopsy, PET scan and magnetic resonance spectroscopy, these are the mainstay for identifying the metabolic active areas uh, of the tumor. So if, for example, the tumor is present in the brain stem, which is quite rare for glioblastoma, you can actually use PET scan or MRS and then you can see which areas of the brain are metabolically active for the tumor growth and you can get a biopsy from there. But if the tumor is present in a more resectable uh, place, say it is present in the frontal lobe or the temporal lobe, we can go with maximal safe resection. That is the mainstay of treatment, of the initial treatment for newly diagnosed glioblastoma in adults because that has been shown to extend the survival of the patient and also um, it has been uh, linked to better outcomes of glioblastoma. But we have to keep in mind that maximal safe resection should be done with preservation of neurologic function. We have to prevent collateral damage to the brain. And so the important initial goal um, for us is that uh, in patients with high-grade glioblastoma, the extent of surgery, it must be balanced with the preservation of neurologic functions. Now, here I wanted to add some intraoperative techniques that are being used by neurosurgeons all around the world now. These were not uh, present um, a few years back when things were evolving, the imaging modalities were not as good as they are right now. In, in these techniques, there are three that are most important. Number one is the awake craniotomy. So in this, basically there is direct electrical stimulation and repetitive neurological and language assessments during the surgery. So the surgeon knows if the patient is developing any language deficits and he can stop right there because we know that we do not want to cross that line or else the patient is going to end up with a permanent neurologic deficit. And then you have intraoperative MRI, which is to guide the resection in real time. So as the surgeon is operating, you get MRI scans, and then you can see where the tumor is located, how, how far you can go, and when you have to stop. The third one is a, uh, is a rather new uh, thing. This is the 5 ALA. So this is an oral optical imaging agent, which is used to visualize malignant tissue during surgery. So. Okay, so post-operative treatment of glioblastoma. This, again, depends on the overall functional status of the patient. So once the surgery or the stereotactic biopsy is done, now we have to think about how to prolong survival and how to improve the quality of life for patients. Because remember, glioblastoma is not entirely curable, so um, we cannot completely cure it. We can only prolong the survival of the patient. So uh, this basically depends on the post-operative status of the patient and also on the MGMT methylation status, which I talked about in uh, previous slides, that MGMT and IDH, these are the new molecular and genetic characteristics that are now playing an important part in uh, guiding therapies. So the medical management basically consists of three things. Either we do concurrent chemo radiation with or without alter alternating electric field therapy, or we do radiation alone, or we do the chemotherapeutic agent alone, which is temozolomide. So this is again an amazing um, flowchart that is showing how uh, we can select the different therapies. This is quite complex. We don't have to remember any uh, dosages of temozolomide or the radiation dosages. It's just to show you a whole picture. So first you do the maximal safe resection or you do the biopsy alone. And now the main thing that is going to decide the medical treatment is the functional status of the patient. We have the Karnofsky performance status, which is from zero to 100 and it rates the patient from 0 to 100 based on different parameters. And then on that, we have, after we've done the performance status grading of the patients, we can now actually see what we are going to do 
uh, with the medical management. So then we uh, divide the patients based on their age uh, and based on the MGMT status. And the end point of all of this is that we get to choose between short course of radiation therapy alone or supportive care or temozolomide alone or concurrent therapy. So these are all the things that um, are pretty advanced and beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. But the point is that we divide patients based on their MGMT status, based on their age, and based on their post-operative functional status to sort of decide which treatment to go on with. Next, I wanted to add certain clinical trials that are being um, done. Uh, and as we have advanced in finding new molecular, um, you know, and genetic features of glioblastoma uh, tumors, we now have um, you know, a, a chance of developing targeted therapy, just like we have in so many different cancers. So we have the cellular regulatory pathway with tyrosine kinase and signal transduction inhibitors. These are being investigated. Then uh, the second one is the immunotherapy vaccine, which targets EGFR variant. This is known as Rintega. This is the newest um, thing that is going on these days. And then we have certain agents which are being used in other cancers like lung cancer, the PDL1 receptor antagonist, the pembrolizumab, and the CTLA4 receptors. So the, uh, this is just to show that there is room for further research on this. And um, once we get um, something that targets specific receptors on glioblastoma, I think we can actually advance in uh, its treatment and maybe a possible cure. But as of today, we have to remember that glioblastoma still um, is a devastating disease, and about 70% of patients with glioblastoma will experience disease progression within uh, just one year of diagnosis. And so in that case, uh, re-resection is an option for some patients. Uh, sometimes that is not an option, but because of the mass effect on, and the debilitating physical symptoms, you have to debulk the cancer and alleviate those symptoms but then the patient is left with permanent neurologic deficits. Um, as in my uh, personal experience if, um, uh, of a family member that um, the tumor was located just near the optic chiasm. So when it was re-resected, there was loss of eyesight in the patient. Um, Rechallenging with temozolomide can be another option. And there are other agents that are specific for the recurrent glioblastoma like uh, carboplatin, etoposide, irinotecan, and the nitrosuria-based chemotherapeutic agents now, the dosages and the regimens will be different uh, than those uh, that were used with temozolomide or the radiation therapy. But the point is that now we will have the challenge of the side effects that is common with these chemotherapeutic uh, agents. And so with a patient with recurrent disease, and then you're going on with these agents, supportive care and palliative management will be the mainstay. And uh, patient education will be another thing that would be very necessary for improving their quality of life. And you have to uh, see their various options. Uh, the last thing is the vasizumab, which is known as Avastin. This is uh, a monoclonal antibody. This is uh, FDA approved for recurrent glioblastoma. But uh, despite all these um, treatments and all these um, you know, advances in glioblastoma research, uh, this still is a devastating disease. And um, it is known as the terminator because uh, it, it has no cure and it comes back right after resection and the medical management. And so the prognosis is very poor. Uh, the five-year survival rate is less than 5% as of now. And so uh, there is room for further research on this topic. And I hope that in the future, we can come up with treatments that can prolong the survival and also improve the quality of life in patients. These are the references that I used for this video presentation. And thank you so much for your time and your attention. Feel free, to, if you have any questions, you can reach out. Thank you.